Good morning, church family. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. It's page 987 if you're using your pew Bible. <clears throat> so in our ongoing study through Matthew's Gospel, we're still in the second half of what is known as the Olivet Discourse. This is the last large block of Jesus' teaching that Matthew records for us. And Jesus gave this teaching to His disciples on the Mount of Olives. That's why we call it the Olivet Discourse. And He spent the first part of this teaching talking about the coming end of the Old Covenant age when He would pour out His wrath and judgment against His enemies, against His false people who refused to repent and come to Him in faith. And of course, that did indeed happen in the year A.D. 70 when uh, He used the uh, Roman army to destroy the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Then in the second half, Jesus turns His attention to an event that has not yet happened even today, an event we're still looking forward to with eager anticipation, and that's, of course, His second coming. His parousia was that key Greek word we've seen over and over again. His glorious, uh, bodily, visible return from heaven when He will come again to judge the world, to punish the wicked, and to reward the faithful. And whereas His people would recognize the end of the Old Covenant age, uh, by the signs that Jesus foretold, uh, the abomination of desolation, the Roman army's coming. In contrast, His second coming, He says, it's not going to have any such signs like that. It's not going to have any massive, huge indicators that they would be able to say, here it comes! This is it! It's time! No, uh, His second coming is going to be unknown. Unknowable. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to come like the flood in the days of Noah. It's going to come like a thief in the night. And so up until that day, life will be going on as usual. And so we, who are the people of Jesus Christ, we must live in such a way that no matter when our Master returns, He will find us faithful. And Jesus is telling three parables then to emphasize the unpredictable timing of His return and to illustrate different things about how His people are to live until He does come again. So we've already seen two of these. First, at the end of chapter 24, He told that brief parable about the wise servant who faithfully obeyed His Master's orders during His long absence, and then the wicked servant who used His Master's delay as an excuse to take and try to usurp his master's belongings for his own. And second, last week we looked at that parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Or if you remember, five smart ones and five stupid ones. They all claim to be eagerly awaiting the arrival of the bridegroom, but then by their actions, by their preparation, they revealed whether they were truly his people or not. And so this morning we're going to look at the third of these three parables often called the parable of the talents. And in this parable, Jesus is going to tell us, Jesus is going to show us in more detail about what a good and faithful servant does. But we've got to remember, our actions reveal our character, right? And so the focus here is not so much on what a good and faithful servant does. We're going to rather frame this in terms of what a good and faithful servant is. Because what we do is revealed by our, or what we are is revealed by what we do. And then we're going to see finally when our master does come again after his long delay, what a good and faithful servant receives from him. So I trust you've turned there by now, Matthew 25. We're going to begin reading in verse 14 and read through verse 30. The Apostle Matthew, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, records these words from our Lord Jesus. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. 
Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you deliver to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master, his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Living God, help us to hear your word. Help us to truly understand. Uh, help us to understand so that we may believe. And that believing, help us to follow you in all faithfulness and obedience. May we seek your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So again, right off the bat, in this parable, Jesus is still talking about his second coming. He starts off, for it will be like, and that it refers back to the beginning of the previous parable. Back in verse 1, he says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like, and that then refers back to his, when he first started talking about his second coming. And he, he said that second coming, his parousia is going to be on a day when you do not expect, and a day and an hour when you do not know. And so then, since we do not know, since we cannot know the day or the hour of his return, then how are we to live in the meantime? Now, I think for all of us in this room, we've probably heard this parable uh, before. We're probably pretty familiar with it. It contains those blessed words that we all long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Countless generations of uh, the people of Jesus Christ have lived in eager anticipation and joyful longing to see their master's face and to hear him say those words. That's the goal, right? That's the goal of the Christian life. That's our deepest desire. That's the joy of every longing heart that the hymn writer said. That's the joy of and hope of every believer in every time and every place. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> But how can we be assured of hearing those words? What does this parable tell us of what we need to do, of what kind of person we need to be to have the confidence that we will hear our master say, well done? We have to be good and faithful servants, right, in order for our master to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We have to be faithful with the talents that our master has given us. We should note right here off the bat that in biblical times, of course, a talent was a sum of money. It's a large sum of money. It's not a specific uh, sum like a denarius is often called a day's wage. A talent is, is just a large sum of money, and it was probably comprised of precious metals. It could be a large sum of gold or, or silver or, or copper or whatever. Um, and a talent could be, uh, it could be worth as much as a, life of, a lifetime's worth of wages for a working man. This is a massive sum of money, even though it's not specifically described. It's a massive, almost unimaginable sum of money. And so to be entrusted with a talent, that was a big deal. But to be entrusted with two or with five talents, this would have been to be entrusted with an unimaginably large amount of money. This would have been to have been, uh, to have been given a massive amount of responsibility to the servant from the master. This would have been a massive amount of trust given to a servant from the master. And it's largely because of this parable that in our modern English language, the word talent has come to mean what we think of it today. A talent is like a, a, a gifting or a skill or, 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 or a passion, especially in terms of uh, artistic skill or musical skill or, or a skilled craftsman crafting things with his hands, or maybe a, a, a highly specialized uh, technical field like surgery 
We think of these things as talents. But Christians throughout the ages have recognized that when it comes to this parable, when it comes to applying Jesus' words here to our own lives, a talent is simply whatever you have. It's whatever you have. It's whatever God has given and entrusted to you that you can use for Him and for others. J.C. Ryle put it this way. He said, anything whereby we may glorify God is a talent. Our gift, our influence, our money, our knowledge, our health, our strength, our time, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our memory, our affections, our privileges as members of Christ's church, our advantages as possessors of God's Word. All these and more are talents. And then he says, from where did these things come? What hand bestowed these things? Why are we what we are? Ryle says, why are we men and not worms that crawl on the earth? He says there's only one answer to that, to that question, and that's all that we have is a loan from God. We are God's stewards. We are God's debtors. So in other words, beloved, whatever you have, no matter how big or small it may seem to you, no matter how grand or how insignificant it may seem to you, everything you have, whatever you have, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God, and He's given those gifts to you in the measure He has seen fit to give to you to steward and invest for His sake, for the sake of the increase of His household, the spread of His kingdom. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go along this morning. And at the end, I'm going to come back to that, and I'm going to ask you to think and pray about what are your talents. What has God given you that you can use and invest for His kingdom? But before we get there, this morning I want to lay out five principles, five characteristics of good and faithful servants, five traits that true followers of Jesus Christ ought to be displaying in their lives. So first, good and faithful servants are responsible. They're responsible. Back in verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Now there's a couple different words in the New Testament that are often translated as servant. The most common word is diakonos. Diakonos, that's where we get our English word deacon. A deacon in the church is an office uh, that is set up in the church that the the person inhabiting that office is dedicated to serving God through serving God's people. But the word, that's not the word he uses here. It's not the word diakonos. No, the word here in in this, uh, this parable is doulos. And doulos in its most literal sense means slave. Slave. Now, in most of our English modern translations, the word doulos often gets softened. We don't like translating it slave. We often translate it servant because in our day and age, unfortunately, we have those connotations with, with, uh, with uh, slavery, especially in American history and our uh, race-based uh, chattel slavery. But that's not always what doulos meant in the first century Roman Empire. A doulos, a slave, could be anything from the lowest household servant who just cleaned up the trash and and did the, the, the dirtiest and most demeaning work possible, but it could also mean anything all the way up to the highest head of the household. Sort of like a butler, maybe, or, or, or an estate manager of some kind. Even though he was a slave, he was a doulos, he was still entrusted with an extremely high level of responsibility over the master's household, over the master's property, and even over the master's family and children in some cases. So then when the master went away on, the long, on this long journey, this high-ranking slave, this doulos, would basically be given complete control, complete uh, power of attorney, we might say today, over the master's household. He was delegated all authority to care for the master's household, to oversee the master's interests, to manage all the master's affairs while the master was absent. And that's the kind of person Jesus is describing here. These servants are not simply hired hands, They are doulos, the plural is douloi, slaves. These are men who are completely and utterly dependent upon their master for everything they have in life, but they are also given the blessing of being entrusted with the matter's property, his interest, his money. So notice also that uh, these these doulos, these douloi, they know their place. 
They know where they are in the master's household. They understand their level of responsibility, but also their status as still slaves. But also, the master knows their proper place. He gives to each of them according to his ability. The master has placed these men in the proper place in his household hierarchy according to their abilities. That's not a popular sentiment in this day and age. We live in an age of growing uh, socialistic and egalitarian uh, sentiments. We want equality of outcome. We have politicians at all levels saying they want equality of outcome. Equality of outcome is, it's, frankly, it's an impossibility. <laughs> and it's really a moral monstrosity to try to impose that on anyone or any level of society because the simple fact is that reality doesn't work that way. Equality of outcome is contrary to reality, and that's the case because God just doesn't work that way. God doesn't work based on equality of outcome. People are different. People are created different. People have different abilities and different giftings and different talents. And God not only recognized that, guess what? God designed it that way. And so it's good for us to recognize that. The commentator Richard France said that the kingdom of heaven is not a one-size-fits-all economy. Paul talked about this at length in 1 Corinthians. We have different gifts as the body of Christ, and that's what makes us, helps us work together, and it's a beautiful thing. God gives his servants, his slaves, he gives them and entrusts them with talents. He entrusts us with something extremely valuable. He gives us the responsibility over these valuable things but he does it to each according to his ability. And in this plane of existence, on this side of glory, sometimes that can be cause for contention and bitterness and quarreling among us as the body of Christ. But in the kingdom of heaven, on the other side of glory, that won't be the case. So the true servants of the master, they know their rightful place, they know their place in God's household, and they act accordingly. They know that they're only slaves in their master's household. They live and serve at the goodwill and trust of the master. They understand that what has been entrusted to them is not actually theirs, but rather belongs to their master. They know that even if their master is delayed far longer than they had initially anticipated, they know that they will eventually be called to give account to their master who has given to them according to their ability. So good and faithful servants are responsible. Second, good and faithful servants are diligent. They're diligent. Verse 16, He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. And so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. Now diligent basically means hardworking, right? Hardworking, yes. But diligent also carries... Um, the connotation of working towards a specific goal, of continuing to work, of persevering despite hardships, of keeping on keeping on, of overcoming setbacks, and doing so under some sense of oversight or accountability. For example, a college student. A college student works diligently, not necessarily because he or she loves the the work of studying and writing papers in and of itself, um, even though they might, but there's a goal at the end, right? There's a goal as a student, and that goal is a degree. And along the way, you have, uh, 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 as you pursue that degree, there's professors and there's teachers that set standards. They set checkpoints and they monitor checkpoints. They administer tests and examinations. And finally, they act as a certifying body that at the end of the course, they will say, yes, you have met the standard. Here is your degree certifying that you have met the criteria to be an alumnus of this institution. That's the sense of these servants here. They're responsible for the master's property, and so they immediately go out and begin to work diligently to increase it. The goal is increasing the master's household. And they do this because they know that they will be called to give an account when he returns. So good and faithful servants are diligent. Third, good and faithful servants are investors. They're investors. Now, how were they diligent and responsible? They immediately went out and traded with what the master had given them. They invested the master's property. They didn't just take what the master had given them and go on a a shopping spree. They didn't go out and buy nice things for themselves. They didn't even go out and buy things for the master, things they thought the master might like to have around his house. 
Now, if you notice at the beginning of this parable, the master didn't give them any specific instructions, right? He didn't say, I'm giving you five talents. Here's what I want you to do with it. Go invest some here, invest some there, buy one of these, buy some livestock with this. He didn't do that. Jesus simply says the master entrusted to the servants his property. There's no explicit commands given. But the level of trust that the master gave to his servants and the vast amount and the worth of the property that he entrusted to them, it carried an implicit understanding, didn't it? He's saying, I'm trusting you to do something with this. Now, in those days, they didn't have a banking industry like what we have today. There's no stock market. There were no bonds. There was no savings accounts. They didn't have 401ks or or IRAs. But whatever kind of of industry they had in that first century uh, economy, these servants knew what it was. They understood the system. They went out at once and they began trading using the money they had been given. Maybe they uh, found a merchant. Maybe they invested in this merchant's business to increase his wares, and in trade they got a share of the profits. Maybe they were, they, maybe they were savvy shoppers. They went out to the, the, uh, the uh, uh, flea markets and the garage sales, and they sought for valuable things, and they restored them and flipped them for a profit. Maybe they got into the uh, business of lending money themselves with interest. Whatever the case, <clears throat> they invested Now, in those days, by the way, in those days, uh, Jews did not charge each other interest. There's a passage in the Law of Moses that forbids that. They wouldn't charge other Jews interest. And so in order to invest money and get interest, that meant they were doing business with the Gentiles, with the Romans. But whatever the case, as soon as their master left, they immediately got busy investing. Investing his resources to gain a profit for the purpose, the goal of increasing the master's household. Good and faithful servants are investors. Fourth, good and faithful servants are risk takers. Risk takers. Again, there's no banking industry. There's no stock market. There's no kind of insurance. There's no guarantee that their investments would indeed return uh, an interest or a profit. But that didn't hold them back. They got out there. They began investing. They took risks. Now, they weren't careless or foolhardy. They they knew the market, they knew the economy, they assessed the various situations, they would have weighed the pros and cons, they would have counted the cost. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? Again, Richard France, he puts it very bluntly, he simply says, risk is at the heart of discipleship. That's convicting to me, too. I tend to be risk-averse, I'll confess that. I tend to be risk-averse. I have a hard time taking risks. But risk is at the heart of discipleship, and this is evidence of it. The investors, the, the servants got out there and invested, which involves taking calculated risks. And following Jesus involves risk in and of itself, doesn't it? Following Jesus is risky business. You risk, uh, you risk losing your friends. <clears throat> you risk alienating your family. You risk uh, severing uh, long-held relationships. You can risk your reputation. Uh, depending on what, the, what kind of climate you might be living in, you might even risk your job, your financial stability, which can involve risking your home. Or depending on, in, in other places in the world, you could even risk your life. That's why Jesus said that following him was taking up your cross. Of course, as we follow him, we count the cost and we realize that the rewards for following him are the most glorious and eternal rewards that anyone could possibly imagine. But of course, there are no eternal rewards without earthly risk. So what will you invest for his kingdom? What will you risk? Good and faithful servants are risk takers. Fifth, good and faithful servants are far-sighted. Far-sighted. Uh, Verse 19, now after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. We're going to come back to that unfaithful servant in verse 18 in just a minute. The master went on a journey. He didn't come back until after a long time. Remember last week we saw the bridegroom was delayed until the middle of the night. But even though the master was delayed for a long time, the good servants didn't get tired. They didn't grow impatient. They didn't slack off in their diligence. 
They didn't think that, they didn't begin to think like the wicked servant a couple weeks ago, that this is really mine and I can do what I want and be cruel to others with it. No, they kept working. They kept investing. They kept working towards that goal of increasing the master's household. They kept on building the kingdom. They weren't living in a constant state of fear or anxiety over the timing of the master's return. They weren't sitting around watching the skies. They weren't trying to decipher the day and the hour when he would come back. I've said this before, beloved, and I'm sure I'll say it again. I think the American church is is far too fixated on trying to figure out when Jesus is going to come back. I think that's to our detriment. I think, uh, by and large, we are too focused on trying to predict and decipher world events and and newspaper headlines to the point where it's become a distraction from the, the mission of the church. Many people who, who, who have that, those views, they're focused on evangelism. That's good. That's important. Yes, of course, that's necessary. But evangelism, telling people about Jesus and the gospel, it's a good thing. It's the first thing, but it's not the only thing. Because we're not simply called to make converts, right? Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means learning how to obey all that He has commanded His people to do. How to live long and full lives of fully orbed obedience in case our Master does not come back for a long time. So once someone becomes a Christian, then now what? What does he do? How does he live? If we're so concerned with just predicting when Jesus is going to come back, we don't have a good answer then. We're far too concerned with trying to know things that we cannot know, and the expense, unfortunately, I believe, has been truly building up the kingdom. We're far too concerned with making converts at the expense of making disciples. We're far too concerned with getting people in the front door without really giving them a place to live. We're far too concerned, I think, with what's happening in the Middle East right now than with working to build our own families and our own churches and our own communities, our own institutions, yes, even our own nation. Things that will endure, things that will last, things that will help provide a framework for living the Christian life for future generations. It's relatively easy, if you think about it, it's relatively easy to say, yes, if the Lord comes back tonight, I'm ready. But I think what's far more difficult is to say, if the Lord returns 10,000 years from now, I'm ready. I'm ready to live my entire life and die in the faith, passing on the faith to my children and their children and their children because the Lord might not come back for 10,000 years and I'm ready to live that way over a lifetime and prepare others to live that way over their lifetime. That's far more difficult, I believe. It's far more difficult to say over the course of the rest of my life, I am going to do everything in my power. I am going to invest as much as I possibly can out of whatever God has given me to help not only myself, but future generations be ready to make those same sacrifices too. Or as I've said before, we need to preach like a pre-mill and build like a post-mill. I'll let you parse that out for yourself. The point is that good and faithful servants, beloved, are far-sighted. Take the long view. So we've seen five characteristics now of good and faithful servants. Now we're going to go back and look at that third servant, the wicked and unfaithful servant, and we're going to see the contrast between his character and the character of the faithful servants. Let's go back to verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. And so the first thing we see about the wicked and unfaithful servants is that they are irresponsible. Wicked and unfaithful servants are irresponsible. The good and faithful servants, they knew their place. They understood they were just slaves in the master's household, no matter how high-ranking and how much they had been entrusted with might be. They understood that they, were called, they would be called to give an account when the master returned. But this servant shows no such understanding, no sense of, of place. No sense of accountability. There's no humble recognition of the master's placing him in his household. And so there's no sense of responsibility over that which his master has entrusted to him. He's he's still been entrusted with a talent. I was talking with my wife this week about this, and she said, I've always wondered if the the first servant was jealous of the other two because he wasn't entrusted with as much. That's a possibility. There's nothing explicitly in the text that says that, but knowing human nature, I think that's pretty plausible. 
oh, Jesus, you're only going to get, you gave him five, you gave him two, you only gave me one? What's the point? He's still been entrusted with a talent. A talent is a vast sum of money, possibly even a lifetime's worth of, of wages, but he just doesn't seem to care. And so what does he do? Nothing. He doesn't do anything with his master's wonderful and valuable property that he has been entrusted with. Wicked and unfaithful servants are irresponsible. Second, wicked and unfaithful servants are negligent. They're negligent. The good servants were diligent, right? They were hardworking with the master's money, but this servant was negligent. He just buried it in the ground. Now, in those days, this was actually a common practice because they didn't have banks or security or vaults like we have today. And so they would often, people would often take their money or their valuables and they would bury it in the ground so that they wouldn't be stolen. We saw that already, remember, in the parable of the pearl of great price. In fact, some would argue that it would actually be safer to do this. It's safer to bury the money in the ground instead of investing it with the bankers because, again, there's no stock market, there's no insurance or anything. The only people who were lending money uh, probably would have been more like a, a bookie, someone of questionable moral character or integrity. But this servant was wicked. This servant was lazy. Instead of working towards a goal in the knowledge that he would be called to give account, he simply took the safe way out. He simply buried his master's property in the ground. Wicked and unfaithful servants are negligent. Third, wicked and unfaithful servants are squanderers. Squanderers. So not only was this third servant irresponsible and negligent, he effectively squandered his master's money. He didn't invest it, so he didn't make any kind of return. He didn't even put it with the bankers who, again, even if they were shady characters, potentially he could have gotten what some historians say was about a 6 to 10% interest rate. It's not that much, but it's more than nothing. But not only that, he didn't even go out and, and buy anything with the money. He could have gone out and bought some new blankets for the master's house or some new, new pots or something, or maybe uh, some new livestock. But he didn't do anything. He did nothing. J.C. Ryle again, he says, To hide our talent is to neglect opportunities of glorifying God when we have them. The baptized Bible despiser, the prayer neglecter, the Sabbath breaker, the unbelieving, the sensual, the earthly minded, the trifler, the thoughtless, the pleasure seeker, the money lover, the covetous, and the self-indulgent, all alike are burying their Lord's money in the ground. They all have light that they do not use. They might all be better than they are, but they are all daily robbing God. He has lent them much, and they make Him no return. So are you investing the talents that God has given you? Or are you burying them in the ground? Wicked and unfaithful servants are squanderers. Fourth, wicked and unfaithful servants are excuse makers. Excuse makers. When the master returns, then what does the master or what does the servant say to him? Go down to verse 24. He also who had received the one talent came forward and saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Now, some, some commentators say that this is intended to be a, a literal description of what God's going to be like. Possibly, there's a sense in that he is master over the whole earth and he will reap the entire earth to find his, uh, his faithful people from among the wicked. But I think this is more just an exaggerated excuse that the wicked servant makes. He's making this excuse of this exaggerated nature of the, the character, the, the fearsome and harsh character of the master. He's using that as an excuse, to hide behind an excuse to justify his irresponsibility and his negligence. Because we haven't seen that in the master in this parable, short though it may be, right? We've seen a master who has entrusted slaves with vast sums of money. That suggests a good and trusting character, a kind and trusting master. Not a harsh one, not a wicked one, 
I was scared. He says, I, I was scared and I was afraid because I thought that when, when you would came back, not only would you take back the talent that you gave to me, but you'd take away any interest that I had earned and maybe even you'd take away the little bit of things that I have myself. I didn't want you to lose the things I had and so I just hid what you gave me. So here you go. Just take it back. You, you've, you've got your initial investment back. God is certainly a hard master in the sense that his unfaithful servants will be punished, but he is also good as evidenced by his trust to the the other servants and by his rewards to them, as we'll see in just a moment. So what are you doing with the talents God has given you? Are you taking strategic risks for his kingdom, or are you just making excuses? Are you hiding behind exaggerations of God's character? Are you blaming God? for not investing what he has given you. Wicked and unfaithful servants are excuse makers. Fifth, wicked and unfaithful servants are nearsighted. Good and faithful servants are farsighted. Wicked and unfaithful servants are nearsighted. Because this servant wasn't taking the long view. He was taking the closest view possible in that he was only thinking about saving his own skin. He wasn't planning for the master to be away for such a long time. He was only thinking about himself. He was so concerned with making excuses and ignoring the trust that his master had placed in him that he failed to be far-sighted. He failed to take an eternal and heavenly view of things. So don't be like this servant, beloved. You've often heard that you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Well, the only way to be any earthly good is to be truly heavenly minded. Not just floating along six feet, six inches off the ground, but really having the mind and the heart of Jesus Christ for the world. That's the way to be any earthly good. Wicked and unfaithful servants are near-sighted. So we've seen these five character traits now of good and faithful servants. We've seen the contrasting traits of the wicked and unfaithful servants. And then in the final part of the parable, we're going to see what each kind of servant receives when the master finally returns. So let's go back to the good and faithful servants. The first thing that good and faithful servants receive is commendation. Commendation. Verse 20. He who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, and saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also the one who had two talents came forward and said, You've given me two. I've made two. And the master gives the exact same words to him. He says the same thing to the one with five who made five and the one with two who made two. He gives them commendation. Well done! He doesn't say to the one that had five, you did better. No, he says to both of them, well done. I approve. Good job. Bravo. You did the right thing. And so even though the master left them no specific instructions, they were still found faithful upon his return. They received commendation. Second, good and faithful servants receive praise. Praise. He says, well done, good and faithful servants. They weren't just neutral servants. They didn't just do the bare minimum. They didn't simply go along and not do something wrong. No, they were good and faithful. They actively pursued goodness. They actively served in faithfulness while the master was away for the duration of his absence. As the kids say today, they understood the assignment. (laughs) And so the master gives them praise. Third, good and faithful servants receive responsibility. Responsibility, that's surprising. The master says to each of them, you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Uh, you, you You may have heard of something called the Peter Principle. I saw the Peter Principle firsthand way too many times when I was in the army. The Peter Principle says that in a hierarchy, every employee tends to rise to the level of his incompetence. You've heard this before? In other words, if you do a good job at your current level in the hierarchy, you're going to be promoted. And at the next level, if you do well at that, you're going to be promoted again, and so on and so forth. You're going to keep being promoted until you're in a position where all of a sudden you're in over your head. And your incompetence is exposed for all your subordinates to see. And thankfully, that's not true in the kingdom of God, beloved. (laughs) 
Our master has placed each and every one of us exactly where he wants us according to our ability. And if you have the godly ambition to move up and get promoted to do more, how to do that? Be faithful. Be faithful with little. Be faithful where you are with what he's given you now. In order to be entrusted with much, you must first be faithful with little. And when Jesus comes back, our existence, our state of existence in the new heavens and the new earth, we're not going to be up there all floating around on clouds wearing white robes and halos and strumming a harp. No, that's not from the Bible. That's from the Three Stooges. No, we are going to be given responsibility. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like because the Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us what. It only tells us that. We're going to be given work, true and good and meaningful and productive work to do. We're going to be given things to do for our Lord and Master. His good and faithful servants, when He returns, they will receive responsibility. And fourth, good and faithful servants receive reward. Reward. Enter into the joy of your master. And again, he says the exact same words to the servant with five who made five more, to the servant with two who made two more. That's not equality of outcome. That's simply the same words of commendation for both. God's rewards, just like His giving of gifts, are fair, and they're just, and they're right, and they're good. There's, there, are, there are going to be degrees of reward in heaven. The Bible tells us this. But even though there will be degrees, I, I can think of a lot of people I've known in my life who are going to have a whole lot more reward in heaven than I am. But that's going to be good. And when I see that, I'm not going to be jealous. I'm not going to be bitter or envious. I'm going to be joyful because they were faithful with God and trusted them with. And during my sojourn here on this life until the Lord comes again, all I can hope to do is be faithful with what He's given to me as well. There's not going to be any, any, any resentment or bitterness against others for what they receive from the hand of God. The hymn writer said, Whatever my God ordains is right. At the end of the day, when the master comes, he's going to give to each of his good and faithful servants exactly what they deserve. No more, no less. But for all of us, great and lowly alike, the supreme and ultimate joy will be the unveiled presence of the master himself. Enter into the joy of your master. That is the reward for all of us who are faithful. Good and faithful servants receive reward. But then finally, of course, we can't leave this parable without turning to that wicked and unfaithful servant. What did he receive? First, wicked and unfaithful servants receive condemnation. Condemnation. Verse 24. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, hey, you have what is yours. But his master, his master saw through his excuse, right? His master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. The master sees through his excuse. The master recognizes his character or rather his lack thereof. And he calls him out. Doesn't let him get away with it. He calls him out on it. He was irresponsible and he was negligent because he himself was wicked and slothful, lazy. He was an unprofitable servant. He was faithless. He was lazy. He was selfish. He didn't even try to give the master any return on his investment, his investment either with the talent that he was given or on with him himself. He received condemnation. Second, wicked and unfaithful servants receive castigation. Castigation. Second part of verse 26. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and that I gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. Castigation. That means chastisement. It means to be called out. It means to be scolded, to be publicly corrected in a humiliating way, to be severely reprimanded for your actions. So the master saw through the wicked servant's pathetic excuse for his laziness and his inaction, and he said, oh, okay, that's your excuse? You're going to turn this back on me? This is what you think of me, the kind and generous master who gave you a talent? That's the kind of person you think I am? Okay, Okay, fine. If that's the kind of person you claim I am, then you should have worked even harder. At the very least, you should have done something. 
even something that would have only had a small chance of returning a profit, even a tiny profit, like investing with the bankers, because something is better than nothing, and nothing is what you, wicked servant, have brought to me. Of course, the real problem here is not that the master is harsh. The real problem is that the servant is wicked and slothful. They receive castigation from the master. Third, wicked and unfaithful servants receive deprivation. Deprivation, verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. By the way, did you notice that that first servant who had five and was given five and he gave it all to the master, now all of a sudden he's the one with ten, right? The master gave it back to him. He gave everything to the master, but the master evidently turned around and gave him those ten. Nothing invested for Jesus is ever a loss, beloved. Nothing invested for Jesus is ever a loss. Verse 29, For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, beloved, faithfulness brings more and increased opportunities for more faithfulness. But faithlessness, it brings only loss. And if you are an unprofitable servant, God will take what he has given you and give it to another. Someone who will be faithful with it. So are you stewarding what he has given to you? Wicked and unfaithful servants receive deprivation. Fourth and finally, wicked and unfaithful servants receive retribution. Retribution, verse 30. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Retribution means punishment. And here again, Jesus uses this language of eternal punishment, of separation and darkness and anger and wrath and judgment. We've seen this over and over again in the last few chapters of of Matthew. The door was shut. The door of of mercy was shut against the five foolish virgins, and now there remained only judgment. Uh, The wicked servant in chapter 24, he was cut in pieces and put with the hypocrites in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 22, the imposter at the wedding feast, he was cast into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what we just looked at in our Dig Deeper section this morning, back in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus commends the Roman centurion for his faith and says, many will come from east and west to recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Meanwhile, the sons of the kingdom will be cast into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Beloved, do you think that Jesus wants us to take his warnings about eternal judgment seriously? This is unpopular. Hell is an unpopular doctrine today. It's never been particularly popular, but it's probably, possibly more unpopular today than any other time in history. Telling people that there are only two destinations, that there is only one way to be saved from the wrath for which we are all headed apart from that one way, Jesus Christ, that's a message people do not want to hear. You're not going to find the doctrine of hell is one of um, uh, uh, Dale Carnegie's ways to win friends and influence people. But this is a message that all of humanity must hear, all of humanity must heed, and as the people of Jesus Christ, we are given the responsibility to tell this message. Because just ignoring it or downplaying it doesn't make it go away. People have to understand the bad news that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They have to understand that in order for the gospel of Jesus Christ that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That, that, that's the good news. You have to know the bad news before the good news is good news. Telling people these difficult truths about hell and judgment and wrath is part of what it means to love them. It's part of what it means to be a good and faithful servant, to proclaim the whole counsel of God. And so his good and faithful servants will receive reward, but wicked and unfaithful servants will instead receive reward retribution. Last week, we saw the primary difference between the wise and the foolish virgins. That was their preparation, right? Their preparation, or their lack thereof, revealed the true state of their hearts toward the bridegroom. And so what's the primary difference here between the good and faithful servants and the wicked and unfaithful servant? It's service. Service. Faithful, diligent, obedient, and joyful service to the master. They might be saying, Pastor, uh, that's, you're talking about our works. 
we're, we're saved by faith and not by our works. Isn't that right? Yes, beloved. But, that's, but remember, what we do reveals who we are, right? Our actions reveal our identity, our hearts. Faith without works is dead. Jesus repeatedly said things like, if you love me, keep my commandments. Ephesians 2, that classic text that we proclaim and we love, we are saved by grace through faith. Yes and amen. But it also says that we are saved for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's given us good works to do, to serve Him and to serve others. And so the good servants, they proved that they were indeed good servants, faithful servants of the Master. They proved this by their faithful and diligent and therefore profitable service. And in contrast, the wicked servant proved that he was indeed wicked by his faithless and negligent and therefore unprofitable and useless lack of service. So now I'm going to ask you again what I asked at the beginning. What are your talents? The primary image here is money. That's good. Yes, we need money to pay the bills, but God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can and will provide money that we need to pay bills. So that might be money. If you've been blessed with money, then yes, please invest it in God's kingdom. But there's so much more. There's so much more that God has given to His people than that. What has He given you that you can use to serve Him? In the church, if that's the case, praise the Lord, even just one-on-one to another person. What resources, what relationships, what skills, what talents, what passions and dreams, ambitions, what goals has He given to you? Because I promise you, beloved, that what He's given you is different than what He's given me or my wife or my children or anyone else. You have opportunities and relationships that I can't even begin to fathom. So find out what that is and then put it to work. Use it. Invest it. Even if you start small, even if it's just using whatever little thing you have to minister to one other person, just do it. Be faithful where you are. Be faithful with what you have. Whatever God has given to you, that's your talent. Be faithful with it. Be diligent. Be responsible. Take a calculated risk. Step out of your comfort zone. Put your gifts and your your resources, your talents, put yourself to work for God's kingdom. Whatever you do, as long as you are simply being faithful, God will recognize that and He will reward it. There's an old song that says, little is much when God is in it. It's true. If we want to be entrusted with much, we must first be faithful with a little. And even if you don't, even if you recognize something that you have and you don't know exactly what should I do, who should I use this to minister to, what, what direction should I go with what I have, just start by doing something. Just do something. That's a little book by Kevin DeYoung. It's a good little book. Just do something. Like the headlights on a car. When, you, when you're driving in a car at night, you can't see your final destination with the headlights. You have just enough for the stretch of road in front of you. Just enough for the next turn. There's one more quote from J.C. Ryle I'll leave you with. He says, Let us leave this parable with a solemn determination by God's grace never to be content with a profession of Christianity without practice. Let us not only talk about religion, but let us act. Let us not only feel the importance of religion, but do something too. We are not told that the unprofitable servant was a murderer or a thief, but he did nothing, and this was his ruin. Let us be aware of a do-nothing Christianity. Such does not come from the Spirit of God. So how can you be a good and faithful servant? Service. Serving God and serving others. Get busy serving. Be faithful with whatever you have, no matter how small, and watch how God blesses your faithfulness. And then on that day, when our Master returns, you too can be assured of hearing those words. Those words of blessing that every Christian longs to hear above all else. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. You've been faithful with a little bit that I have given you, and now I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your Master. Let's pray. 
Father, as we are the people of Jesus Christ, we know that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. You've commanded us to be strong and courageous because you yourself are with us. You have placed your Holy Spirit within us, and we are forever united to Christ, the risen one. So give us strength, strength in mind and body and in will. Help us not to shrink back from the challenges of life. Help us to not avoid the hardships and the obstacles that will inevitably come as we faithfully uh, invest and steward your resources. But rather, help us to press forward in diligence and in obedience as we know that you are the one who ultimately gives the growth. So help us to be responsible with what you have entrusted to us so that when our Lord does return in glory, he will find us working faithfully to expand his kingdom. And on that day, may we hear him speak those wonderful words of blessing, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen.